Lord of life, everyone seems to be asking the same question. What do we do? How do we fix it? The prophet Isaiah tells us what to do. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. If there is one Bible verse to memorize, perhaps this is it. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. What then is our response to the evidence that we are killing the planet, that we demand more than the earth can give, that the way we do business chokes life? What then is our response when a cry goes out to deport Muslims, to build walls, to leave behind anyone who doesn't quite fit the mold? What then is our response when we are told that the most important thing we should worry about is being the best, the greatest, the most powerful nation? What then is our response to the claim that the country with the most drones wins? Holy One, you have been trying to get us to be your people for a long time. So we'll say the words of your prophet again, and this time listen with our head and heart. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Be with us as we take these words literally, be with us as we take them seriously. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Here ends the reading of words inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. This fall, when the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference of the UCC meets up in Wichita for its annual meeting, I'm going to present two lectures on what it means to be political in the pulpit. That is, without violating the separation of church and state and without getting fired. <laughs> My old friend Edith Guffey, who is our conference minister, uh, and who asked me to speak on this topic thinks, for some strange reason, that I'm uniquely qualified to speak on the topic. <laughs> she said, quote, we thought about importing someone from the national office, but then we thought, hey, wait a minute, Robin's been in the pulpit of a church in Oklahoma for 30 years, and he's been known to be, how shall we put it, political. <laughs> so how does that work? Can you help our pastors who struggle with this issue? and struggle they do. I think I mentioned to you that not long ago I met a woman who'd just been ordained and accepted a call to her first church in New England and the church council met and they informed her that as a condition of her employment, she was never, ever to say anything in the pulpit that anyone in the church might consider political. I wondered, quite frankly, how she was supposed to preach at all, given that according to the broad definition of politics, which I understand as who has the power, how is it exercised, and to what effect, everything Jesus of Nazareth did and said was political. 
course, we already have laws that make it illegal for any religious organization to endorse a candidate or to work directly as a part of his or her campaign without threatening their tax-exempt status. A law that was passed, by the way, in 1954 by then-Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson and that Donald Trump recently told evangelical Christians he would try to overturn. But there is nothing that stops any clergy person from talking about moral issues in the pulpit. Things like immigration reform, guns, military intervention, abortion, same-sex marriage, health care. We're also free to discuss what we believe makes for good character in a candidate, what constitutes qualifications to hold office, and whether the person who professes to be a person of faith has ever actually demonstrated any of the virtues of faith. If we cannot do so, then what becomes of the relevance of the pulpit? That is the number one complaint against preaching, by the way, especially by the young, and I'm old enough now I get to say the young, <laughs> that it is um, irrelevant, irrelevant. But a pulpit that is truly free is a pulpit that interprets the gospel in light of what's actually going on in the world. We might not always like the interpretation or, or even agree with it, but the alternative is for us all to yawn our way through every sermon. It was not surprising to me to learn that the Trump family belonged to the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City, where Donald claims to have been mesmerized by the preaching of Norman Vincent Peale. Of course, Peale asked nothing of his listeners but to practice the power of positive thinking in service to success and wealth. His Bible was how to win friends and influence people. What is more deeply at the heart of this question, however, of whether a pastor can be political in the pulpit is that the failure to do so constitutes a betrayal of the gospel message, as if there is no real gospel message because it can never be brought to bear in any specific way on the world in which we actually live. By our silence, we infer that the gospel itself is never offended by the world in which we live, which is exactly the same thing as saying that the gospel is not a living thing. It said things, but it never says things. It is all past tense, a museum piece, not a conversation partner. Trump wanted to persuade an evangelical crowd that he was a good Christian, so he told the story of having received a copy of the Bible from his grandmother. With her name, he said, written in it. Her name was written right in it, he said. Then when asked a follow-up question, would he name his favorite Bible verse, he hesitated and said, uh, I, I don't want to get too specific. That is, of course, because he could not think of a single Bible verse, but also in a larger and more ironic sense because the Bible is very specific. It is not a collection of stories about what is generally wrong with people, generally speaking, and what they can do in general to address it or how they can trust someone else to fix it for them. It's a testimony of what is our highly specific estrangement from God. The old word for this is sin. And it assumes that the more honest one is in confronting things as they really are, the more the truth is mightier than the sword. Here's how Israel's greatest prophet Isaiah put it, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. 
So, whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, a libertarian or a socialist, that is not the first concern of the gospel. In fact, it would be a partisan imposition on our part to force upon it such a concern. But when a candidate for the most important and powerful job in the world threatens violence against his opponents, it would be impossible for any ordained minister of the gospel to remain silent because this goes against the heart of the gospel to which she is ordained. It makes the world an even more dangerous place and threatens human community. When a candidate targets people of one religion for persecution and deportation, a siren ought to go off deep in the heart of the church because we do know lots of scriptures by heart, including repeated commandments to love the stranger and treat her well because we were strangers in the land once. I did a little research and I, I compiled a list of biblical references in both the Old and New Testament of how we're supposed to treat the resident alien and the stranger in our midst. I came up with so many that there is not time for me to share all of them with you. They're all in the sermon, so you can get a copy and look at them. But too many to put in. Just a, here's a couple. Exodus 22:21, you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 1933, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. Leviticus 23, 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 24, you shall have one law for the alien and for the citizen, for I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 1.16, I charged your judges at that time, give the members of your community a fair hearing and judge rightly between one person and another, whether citizen or resident alien. Deuteronomy 24.20, when you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, the widow. I've got to skip over some of these. Okay, let's see. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, cursed be anyone who deprives the alien, the orphan, and the widow of justice. And all the people shall say, amen. But I like this one um, from Malachi. Don't hear a lot from Malachi. But I think this was actually the one that Donald should have said he memorized. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And then finally, just this one. We are all aliens. We are all aliens. Then there's a whole bunch from the New Testament. Um, Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. You know, you may be entertaining angels unaware. And First Peter, be hospitable to one another without complaining. <clears throat> That's not half the list, but I press on. And every one of these is in the Bible that his grandmother gave him. <clears throat> so when insults demean people, whether they are his rivals or simply those who will not be intimidated by him, or if they are disabled persons, or the gold star parents of a son killed while serving the country he wishes to lead. It is not the Democrat or the Republican in us that rises up to condemn it. It is our common humanity. When someone who might hold the nuclear codes says to generals in a cavalier tone of voice that, hey, if we have nuclear weapons, why can't we use them? It is not our party affiliation that is terrified, but rather our hope for the future for our children and our grandchildren. 
It is, in short, hope itself that is threatened by the depth of the hatred into which so many voters have descended, in particular by an ever-shrinking pool of uneducated white males whose fragile sense of self sees no future unless it is a future in which they remain in charge. They long for a mythical time when America was great because they assume it means a time when America was great for them. But here is what our scriptures say, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hope is what keeps us going. Hope is the one thing for which there's no acceptable alternative. And because hope's rival is fear, and fear's the enemy of the moral life, hope is the best hope we have to overcome the fear that drives the darkest moments in human history. Notice that the text does not say that faith is a list of things you believe. It is instead an orientation toward the future. Abraham's the primary example here, of course, because he left the safety and security of his comfortable life to find a place God had in mind for him. So faith is not about believing something that doesn't make sense because we take it on faith, but rather faith is a refusal to believe that what's broken in the present cannot be made whole one day. It's all right there in your grandmother's Bible, the one she may have signed to you that is so very special to you. But we have to read it. We have to open it first. It makes it easier to read. And then we have to study it. We can't just wave our hands over our heads and say, trust me, I'll fix all these problems. Not like Abraham by setting out with no guarantees to find a city whose builder and maker is God. Rather, I will give you back a mythical place where white people ruled and women knew their place, as did blacks, gays, foreigners, and all the rest of those others, which God must have intended to be your servant and your subject. Maybe, I'm thinking maybe the Olympics, even with all their problems, and certainly there are a lot of problems, maybe they have come along at just the right time. Because I, for one, was getting tired of watching political coverage, and it is nice to watch athletes, these unbelievably beautiful young athletes from all over the world, just trying to make their dreams come true. This is blessed relief. Did you know there is a refugee Olympic team? They have no home, no flag, no national anthem. But they're in Rio competing after fleeing the horrors of war. One of them's a swimmer, 18-year-old Syrian refugee, Yusra Mardini. Pope Francis wrote her a letter wishing her well, and right after it was published, she promptly hopped in the pool and won her heat in the women's 100-meter butterfly. A Syrian refugee. And as you may know, there's a backstory for Yusra. When the boat on which she and her fellow refugees was sinking just off the coast of Greece, she jumped into the water and with her swimming skills helped push it and all its occupants to the shore. Here's what she said. I thought it would be a real shame if I drowned in the sea because I am a swimmer. <laughs> to which I might add, and a human being. Dear Donald, what do you think we should do with people like Yusra? If you are serious about finding some very specific solutions, may I suggest you crack open your grandmother's Bible, but give yourself plenty of time. It is a strange library with lots of warnings, but they all add up to the same message. 
We are all aliens. Even you, Donald, you are an alien. So, as far as politics in the pulpit goes, try this one for size. Either all of us matter or none of us do. Amen.